Hey, everybody. We wanted to give you a special holiday gift because we so appreciate all of your support throughout the year. This is a special bonus episode we're recording for you this week. It's totally ad-free. It's actually kind of what you get when you subscribe to our Patreon, but you guys are all so amazing. You make us feel loved, and we appreciate you. Plus, we uh, wanted to... I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just riffing. Just riffing yeah, here. No, go. We wanted to give you a special holiday treat. So, you know, take you got the family in town. If you need a little break, just drive around the block. Just, you know, listen to some podcasts and um, just know that we love you guys and we appreciate all of your support. And we hope you have a wonderful, safe, healthy and holiday season. Creepin's greetings. That's awful. Cut that. <laughs> <laughs> nope. We're keeping it. A beloved mom, sister, boss, and businesswoman carrying on her family's legacy, co-running the company her father started. When she was found poisoned, her family all had one question. Who could have committed such a heinous act? The list of suspects from her professional and personal lives stacked up, but police never made an arrest. Will there ever be an answer for her family in this decades-old cold case? This week's episode is The Unsolved Murder of Patsy Wright. In the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister We've been sitting on this one since our first, um, or no, our second live show in Dallas on tour yes. when we covered mm-hmm. the meltdown at the Wax Museum. Yeah, we focused all on the Wax Museum itself and the fire and only briefly mentioned this, so we wanted to give it its due in its whole own episode. When we were researching for the Wax Museum, and we knew that there was this tie-in with the owner being murdered But, you know, murder's not uh, funny, so we don't tend to do that stuff on our live shows on tour, because when you're booked at a comedy club, and then you show up and start talking about somebody being poisoned, it's not the best look. In the town that it happened in, especially. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. so we just mentioned it as part of, yes, this is part of the history, we will give it its own respectful Mm -hmm. episode later, but uh, the Wax Museum itself is a wacky place, and that episode is is quite funny. It is. Uh, But we we definitely wanted to dig into this because there are so many... Uh, possible paths, possible suspects. It was um, deep. And, there's layers. Yeah, and, lots of and layers. For, you would think, you know, based on the there's hard evidence involved here mm-hmm. that there would have been some sort of uh, headway made, but it's still listed on, you know, Tarrant County Crime Stoppers, Arlington PD. It's still listed as a cold case. There's a detective, a cold case detective assigned to it. So it is still an open case. So if for some reason anybody, you know, knows anything, if we can bring some sort of insight to it and somebody has some info some family secret somebody confess something then then that might be something we can mm-hmm. at least help move it along or some, shed some light on it for sure yeah we went to um the establishment that patsy co-owned and mm-hmm. um had a wonderful time yeah. so thank you patsy for yeah. giving us all that it's a staple in grand prairie and the dfw metroplex the wax museum and even if it's you know kind of moved ownership and hands and stuff it's that's the start of it. It, it was a family business, mm-hmm. and it's a place where all families go, and you, you can still see at least that still happens. Like, we saw parents with their kids oh, yeah. and, um, you know, entire families running around there. So I, I have fond memories of going there as a kid, and it was very nice to go back, and I still have our wax hands oh, sitting yeah. right here on the Mine studio table. Mine is also sitting right by me. So, Matching so it's our, wax hands. Us holding, clutching our hands to one another, uh, which was a great, great time to make those. So still giving people fun, even yeah. even all these years later. Well, I'm Christy. And I'm Heather. And let's get into it. The State Fair of Texas is known for many things. Big techs, Fletcher's corn dogs, flashy rides on the midway, pig races, turkey legs, and anything you can imagine dipped in oil and fried to a golden brown. However, many are unaware that in 1963... The fair was not only home to hundreds of livestock, but also to an impressive collection of life-size wax figures. It was here that Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Bolton unveiled the Southwestern Historical Wax Museum. It's one of those where, you know, that's not a 
a usual business you get into. It's not no. livestock raising, opening a booth to sell corny dogs. It's I have some figurines. <laughs> Would you like to pay a fare and come in? You know, pay mm-hmm. a fee to come in and see them. But real passionate these these folks. He went to, and we talk about it in the live show. Thomas Bolton went to the Madame Tussauds in mm-hmm. London. Just really dug it and came back <laughs> and said, like, "Why not I'm doing it here?" So. He, he certainly did. Nine years later, in May of 1972, the Boltons moved their now much larger museum to a 35,000-square-foot building on a 10-acre parcel of land off I-30 in Grand Prairie, Texas. The Boltons' two daughters, Sally and Patsy, had also become part of the family business, working alongside their mom and dad. After their father's death in 1976, the Southwest Wax Museum was left to both of them to manage as co-owners. And there's nothing like working with your sister, you know, getting in there and keeping on, especially if you're raised around wax figures. I imagine that's just part of your it's life. part of and your upbringing, yes. You get, you, know, you get passionate about it. And from what I read, there was some, a bit of sibling rivalry, but nothing to the point where it stood out. I mean, every mm. every sister, you know, you might be a little jealous of one another at times or criticize like how they... I handled their love lives, but um, by all accounts, they were close and looked out for one another and ran the business very well. Mm -hmm. Sally married Steve Horning Lockwood in 1981. The two had met after he had been hired to do some landscaping work on the Wax Museum campus, according to D Magazine. That same year, Patsy had met Bob Cox. Though they later married, the pair eventually split up. Their divorce was contentious. Patsy even secured a restraining order from the court to keep Cox away from her after Patsy claimed he was harassing her. With the divorce final, Patsy could focus her attention on what she loved, running the wax museum with her sister. And, you know, we've we've all dated our fair share of, you know, uh, dudes that didn't work out and that maybe, like you said, your sister's got something to say about it and really him. Yeah. That's who you're going to be with. But it, she sounds like she was re- she was. Single now, you know, raising her kids, had this business, ready to go, and this is what makes it so shocking. On October 22, 1987, the Wax Museum was buzzing with preparations for their annual Halloween celebration, one of their most successful events of the year. The dress rehearsal was that night, and Patsy was pleased with the results. She headed home and eventually got ready for bed. Part of her nightly routine was taking a dose of over-the-counter cold medication, NyQuil, to help her sleep a habit those closest to Patsy knew about. This night, she kept with her routine, but the result was not a restful night's sleep. Within minutes of taking the medicine, Patsy began to feel ill. She called her sister, Sally, and told her between agonizing breaths that something was terribly wrong. Sally and her husband, Steve, called the police. Because Patsy was in a rental home while her permanent residence was being built, Sally didn't know the address. Fearing the worst, they hopped in their car and raced to Patsy's house. After crawling in through an unlocked bedroom window, Patsy's brother-in-law found her lying on the bed. Sally would later say it looked as though her sister had simply fainted. But when they were unable to wake her, they realized the situation was far worse. According to Steve, he began administering CPR. But sadly, it was too late. It's totally helpless to be say, come help me, come save me, and then not knowing exactly how to get EMTs to yeah, her. Yeah. And to walk in and first of all, you have to like crawl in through the window. I mean, it's it's just everything, all the like things you could trip over to try and help someone were mm-hmm. in place. Like you didn't mm-hmm. know the address, you had to crawl in through the window. She was just in her pink silk pajamas, just laying on the bed like she had fainted, and mm-hmm. that's what they thought at first, and then uh was not that. Initially, Patsy's family was shocked. As Sally told Unsolved Mysteries. You would never expect that to happen. She was so alive. She was so healthy. There was nothing wrong with her. And when it happened, you're just in awe because you'd never, ever have expected that to happen to her. In addition to the Wax Museum operations, Patsy loved being a mom to her two kids and had just bought two new quarter horses she planned on training. These were just a couple of reasons Patsy's family was adamant with authorities that she could not have died by suicide. Because of her sudden and unexplained death, authorities performed an autopsy. Her blood was tested for 56,000 substances, and when the results were analyzed, one culprit emerged, strychnine. 
They also said her alarm clock went off the next morning, which was another sign to them that Mm -hmm. she had not taken her own life. And she had um, a trip planned, I believe, upcoming and some... She had just paid for some stuff with her horses that she was building um, a ranch in Alito. So she had all these things in place that were just not indicative that she was struggling. Yeah, that's uh, that makes it even more shocking that she it shows that she was just ready for that same nightly routine. Mm-hmm. Take the NyQuil and that. I mean, luckily, she was conscious enough to call her family, although, you know, they it, the timing didn't work out yeah. to, to try to save her. And with. I think that type of a poisoning, it's significant, severe, and uh, quickly acting. Yeah. Uh, from what I read, it is quite a horrific way to go. A lot mm-hmm. of convulsing. Um, your body kind of just seizes up. You're, you start kind of foaming at the mouth. And in between convulsions, you it's almost like labor. Like you have a chance to like relax, but you know mm-hmm. it's coming right back on. So mm-hmm. just anticipating that. And, I mean, you struggle and suffer for, I want to say it was like around 10 minutes. I mean, I guess depending on the dosage, but it was definitely a rough way to go. Mm -hmm. During the search of Patsy's house the night of her death, police had taken the partially ingested bottle of NyQuil from Patsy's nightstand. After testing it, they were not surprised to discover it contained a large quantity of strychnine, more than enough to kill Patsy. Indeed, it was enough to kill nine people. Having already ruled out suicide, the investigation next ruled out product tampering. Sergeant Jay Gustafson was soon tasked with investigating Patsy's death. He found himself in the tricky position of now having to interview grieving family members as possible suspects. As he investigated Patsy's death, he had to ask himself, who had motive? Yeah, that's like your, you know, it's right there in plain sight, too, of like, Mm -hmm. who did this, who had access, and kind of brazen and also you know it involves some cunning and pre-planning to get in the house in advance and do that but you I mean it's one of those where we think that's why active crime scene investigation you know we've seen several cases some we've covered some we haven't where the police go in and kind of bungle everything Mm -hmm. and throw the NyQuil bottle away but luckily in this case everything was collected everything was preserved but you see okay well this, le- this leads us to believe somebody knew what they were doing. And Gustafson says, you know, this wasn't just an act of passion in the moment. Somebody put this in there knowing that this was her routine and then just lied and wait. Like they had mm-hmm. the patience to be like, she could take this tonight. She could take it next week, but it's in there. And just, you know, so they they were able to wait. It wasn't like an immediate thing that needed to happen, which also... I would say narrows down like who could this possibly be yeah and I was looking up kind of the psychology of poisoners and you know it says cunning sneaky creative and somebody that avoids physical confrontation or you know overt aggression and is instead kind of more emotionally or verbally manipulated or manipulative Mm -hmm. and so you see you you can say okay well kind of profile like who's around who's more likely to to do it that way where you know, if she's had aggressive outward, you know, interactions with someone, that may not be the likely suspect when somebody that has to do this, like you said, would lie and wait and would mm-hmm. be real cunning. And you can do it and then not be around mm-hmm. when she dies, you know. Mm-hmm. Patsy's ex-husband, Robert Cox, was questioned by police who told Unsolved Mysteries. He was offered a polygraph test, the same as several others that I had interviewed and taken statements from, and he refused to take the polygraph test. Despite his refusal, Cox maintained that he was innocent, and no further investigation was made into his involvement. And we talked about this before. Polygraph tests are, uh, you know, they're a nervous test. They're not really like a truth-telling test. And I think they're better at indicating if someone's lying versus indicating if somebody's telling the truth. Yeah, but also not 100% accurate. They've been misused in a lot of cases. So, you know, if you ask, would you take a lie detector test? I don't. Maybe not. Yeah, I can't make that call until I'm in that situation, I don't think. But I'm so nervous. And I'm I like, certainly Ugh. wouldn't if I thought at all that I might be implicated. True. Patsy had met Bob in 1981 after he'd asked her and her sister if they wanted to buy his failing wax museum. The purchase didn't happen. However, that didn't stop Bob from asking Patsy out, despite him being married at the time. 
Patsy told him to contact her after he was divorced if he was still interested. The two eventually began dating, and Bob impressed Patsy by whining and dining her and introducing her to the glitzy Dallas social scene. In January 1983, the couple took a trip to Galveston, where Bob took Patsy to a rundown warehouse near the seawall. Inside, wax figures were haphazardly placed around the room. Bob told Patsy this was his new venture and that he planned to remodel the building and have the museum opened in time for tourist season. Just a few weeks later, the building caught fire, destroying it and everything inside. Bob claimed some men seeking shelter had lit a fire for warmth, causing the blaze. Hartford Lloyd's insurance company disagreed and alleged that Bob had intentionally started the fire to collect the insurance money. There's a lot of mentions of fires and wax museums. I mean, they go fast, those figures. What a horror scene to be driven to Galveston, taken to a rundown warehouse, and there's just a bunch of wax figures inside. (laughs) The door opens, and it's just haphazardly placed wax figures. It's terrifying. It's pretty horrific. It's, um, I imagine the wax figure scene, if you're, that's what, you know, you're a, a purveyor of wax figures. It's a close community, and probably yeah. everybody knows each other. Much any kind of weird niche thing like that. Ha- have you ever seen the documentary Chicken People? I have not. You got to watch it. It's What's so good. It, is it about like people that own chickens? Yeah, and show them. Yeah, yeah. Or like the furry documentary. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, watched, yeah. Where it's just you know where people go, oh, you got to go to so and so. They're great, and then oh, you went to so and so. So did I. you know, it's uh, these. Inner, it's. I love the sociology of communities. You mm-hmm. know where it's like how people find each other and what brings them together. Uh, and that's. I'm guessing ownership of a wax museum is a pretty small list. It's yeah. a pretty short list. Yeah. Uh, so of course you get to know each other. Mm-hmm. Thinking nothing of this, Patsy married Bob a few months later. Almost immediately, she confided in friends that his demeanor and personality changed. The once fun-loving high roller who loved to spoil Patsy was now verbally abusive to her and her family, according to D Magazine. Additionally, Bob had a gambling problem, which had been the reason for his previous divorce. Because Bob was constantly losing money, Patsy was left to foot all the bills and to support their lifestyle. And this is something you hear about in abusive relationships, that after, you know, the marriage, oh, yeah. the ink on the marriage certificate's dry, then the, the personality and demeanor changes. Yeah, they have feel like they've locked them down, so their true colors begin to show... And there's um that's a pretty fast way to build resentment is if you're losing all the money that you could be helping contribute to the family and only one person is having to support everyone. Mm-hmm. Through and through something not like well I really tried and this business happened to fail but I spent it all. The no, he was up at Dallas Country Club just gambling yeah. all the time, mm-hmm. like just playing poker all the time. Patsy divorced Bob in 1984 swearing to her friend she would never marry again because I can't trust myself to make a good decision. But the divorce didn't stop Bob from abusing Patsy. He began to stalk her, even disguising his appearance to remain unseen, and once used her own employee's car to tail his ex-wife. A nervous Patsy had a security system installed and got a restraining order against her estranged ex. And that's always rough. You get a divorce, you think it's over. You think it, you know, it gives you some sort of reprieve. And yeah, if he feels rejected, it went the opposite way. Her employee is the one that called her to say, "Um, hi, Bob was just up here and asked to use my car and he took off and I think he's following you now. And so, you know, they knew that he was um, not the most stable and her sister was begging her to get a security system installed because they were worried. So friends, family, employees knew what was going on. Mm-hmm. And were and expressed their concerns. Yes. Patsy was deposed in September of 1986 by Bob's attorney for the Galveston fire incident. Attorneys for the insurance company were also eager to speak with her. They soon learned Patsy had valuable information to their case, including that one of the most valuable items Bob claimed was lost in the fire was actually safe and sound in his office. Sources told D Magazine that a frantic Bob began calling Patsy, begging her to change her testimony. To this, Patsy told her ex-husband, I'm going to tell the truth. Ten days before the trial was to begin, Patsy was murdered. In the end, the insurance company was unable to prove Bob had started the fire, and the jury awarded him $1.3 million. So this all seems real sus, 
Yeah. The timing is not a good look. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he had a history of uh, harassing her, verbally abusing her and her family. I mm-hmm. never read anything about physical abuse, but, you know, who's to say? And then right before he's about to go to trial and, you know, she's kind of the star witness for the prosecution, she winds up dead. Yeah, it sounds like, well, it would be, in this case, it would be the defense, or the or, yeah, plaintiff's the, attorneys. Yes. It, yeah, because the plaintiff's attorneys are trying to sue him so they don't have to pay. But if he would have lost this and they said, okay, well, now we have evidence that you started this fire, you're committing insurance fraud, then criminal charges would be very shortly uh, there behind. So I think there's a lot to lose. Yeah, All a that lot to of say, money. There's a lot to lose, a lot yeah. of money, and then also possibly freedom if a, you know, a jury finds that you you know, started your own fire and made a false claim against the insurance company for that much money. Mm -hmm. And your reputation. Oh, yeah. With Patsy gone, her sister Sally and Sally's husband Steve stood to inherit control of the jointly owned museums, worth millions. Working in Steve's favor was the fact that he tried saving Patsy's life. If he had dosed his sister-in-law with deadly rat poison, why would he be so quick to perform mouth-to-mouth resuscitation when that would endanger him? Steve described the efforts to save Patsy to unsolved mysteries, saying, During that, a lot of green fluid came up from her, and I would continually spit that out onto the bed, or there was a towel there, as I remember. Some, sometime after that, the medics came. However, the only one telling the story of what happened during the resuscitation was Steve. One of the paramedics actually contradicted Steve's story when he told Sergeant Gustafson, Nobody successfully performed CPR on this woman. The, um... 911 call, her sister is, can be heard telling Steve um, kind of how, how to perform CPR. Like, no, you have to put your, your mouth, blow into her mouth and stuff. So it seemed as though she's trying to instruct him. What no one really knows is, did he really attempt to try and successfully perform it? Or was it kind of just a show? Mm-hmm. If he, if he had been the one to poison her, I agree that like, that's, would be silly of him to put his mouth on hers, knowing that she just swallowed a bunch of rat poison. Yeah, ten or nine times mm-hmm. the the amount that it takes to kill one person. Also, she was on the bed, and it was kind of like with Brittany Murphy and or not Brittany Murphy, Simon Monjack. You can't perform CPR on somebody on a bed because mm-hmm. it's too squishy. You know, you're supposed to put them on the floor, and she was he was trying to do it on the bed. But you know, if you're not trained, it, you know, it, yeah. it could be just as easily could be you know incompetence. Um, but you know. Whenever you're investigating all possible aspects, do you go like, was it real incompetence or was it fake incompetence? Exactly. The sympathetic picture painted by Steve also belied a secret rift between him and his sister-in-law. According to D Magazine, Patsy did not like Steve because he spent Sally's inheritance in the few short years of their marriage. The sister's buy-sell agreement for the museum shares, funded by life insurance policies, had been shored up in June of 1987 just months before Patsy's murder. The changes were made, it seemed, to keep Steve's hands off any ownership in the museum. However, with the volume of, however, with the value of the museum skyrocketing, the sisters needed to revamp their agreement. A meeting was set for early November to reconfigure the agreement and its logistics, but Patsy was murdered before the meeting could ever happen. So again, there's a lot of motive here that involves money. And you see a lot of cases when a closely held business, a closely held business, particularly where there's 50-50 ownership and where, you know, you and I say we own 50% of Sinisterhood each and we don't want to run it with the other person's spouse because it's a key man situation. Like, you're key, yeah. I'm key. You know, the sisters wanted to run it together. They she, Patsy didn't sign up to run it with the husband or vice versa. And so what you have is a buy-sell agreement that says on the death of the other partner, there we the company has paid for this life insurance policy. We've de- Deem that the shares of the 50% of the museum are worth, you know, $100,000 or $500,000 or a million dollars. And we pay the premium on a life insurance policy essentially to buy out that person's estate so that the surviving 50% owner can become the 100% owner. So that the company kind of buys it out so that you you stick, stick around. You don't have to run it with, you know, somebody that you're not too fond of. Well, and also if something is to happen to one of them, it... A hundred percent goes to the other partner that you agreed to mm-hmm. run that business with, and it doesn't. Maybe half of it gets taken in a divorce or something like that. Yeah. 
Upon her death, just as Patsy had wanted to avoid, partial control of the museum went to Steve. Rather than passing Patsy's shares to her two children, Sally gave Patsy's adult children only the cash proceeds from the life insurance policy, according to D Magazine. Sally became the full owner of the museum, and Steve had an interest via marital property laws. And the kids wanted the their shares, and yeah. they were not given them because she said that um, the owner, the property had gone up so much that it wasn't fair anymore. Wasn't fair anymore, but that so you see where the I mean it's important to update the agreement, but also you're now going against what mm-hmm. what her her wishes were, and that's you know in this case instead of buying out the family so that it can be a hundred percent owned by the survivor, what they wanted was to buy out the company so it could be owned by the children, and the children would not have to pony up the cash. But it seems like that was disregarded. And maybe it's a situation where you don't want to get into litigation with your aunt and fight her and you just lost your mom suddenly and you're like, you know what, that's fine, whatever. But it definitely, um, it sounds like they did not want, a, you know, a big feud going on in the family. But if you had written the agreement as it is, you know, arguably it should have been enforced. Mm-hmm. They'd already had a big feud when their dad died because their mm-hmm. stepmom wanted his shares and so there was a huge rift between the sisters and the stepmom of who was going to get the museum ultimately they the sisters won out but perhaps that also they were like i don't want to go through something like that again Mm -hmm. with what happened with you know grandpa Mm -hmm. the day after patsy's death the couple that boarded patsy's horses bill and bonnie alexander cashed a check for four thousand dollars that patsy had written to them shortly before her death causing eyebrows to raise Adding to the suspicion, Patsy's financial advisor and best friend, Karen Beatty, was unaware of the transaction. The morning of her death, Karen had spoken with Patsy about liquidating some of her assets. During the call, Karen asked Patsy if she had any outstanding checks. Patsy said no. Patsy's family grew even more suspicious when they discovered Patsy's prized horses were in the Alexander's names. Bonnie had an explanation, according to D Magazine. Patsy had requested her horses be in Bill and Bonnie's names to prevent her brother-in-law, Steve Horning, from being able to get to them should something happen to her. She had it in for Steve, man. Oh, yeah. She's like no money to go to him Mm -hmm. at all. Um, But it's interesting because there are much safer ways to protect your assets from a, uh, you know, relation by marriage or even a blood relative than titling them into someone else's name because would you titled it into somebody else's name they own that mm-hmm. and there's not really you know you could say well i did it for asset protection purposes but they also now just own your horses mm-hmm. so you know put it in a trust something like that but and the horses is... were boarded at their facility so now they so now they technically own them the horses are at their facility so i mean by all accounts they're their horses possession yeah they don't even have to ask for delivery like Mm -hmm. hey our name's on the title of these horses so it i mean it certainly worked out uh if that is what she wanted and why she did it it worked that it worked out but then you then have kept those horses from your kids which i can't imagine was the goal either yeah while it is nothing more than speculation some closest to patsy wonder if bill was harboring romantic feelings towards her patsy had told several friends that if she could find a man like Bill Alexander, I would marry him, according to D Magazine. Patsy spent a significant amount of time with the Alexanders, even living with them for the entire month of June. Is it possible she rejected Bill's advances, not wanting to hurt Bonnie? Fearing he would lose both Patsy and the income from her horses, did Bill poison her? Or is it possible Bill and Patsy were intimately involved, and Bonnie found out? Gustafson told D Magazine, Money is a good motive. So is revenge, love, hate. Sometimes it's just anger, retaliation. Who stands to gain by her demise? You know, who stands to lose if she doesn't die? Good point, Gus. Yeah, there's a, like you said, the, the list of suspects is a mile long, and there's, you know, comments here and there, and then some sort of financial transactions, but the rest of that's just a lot of speculation, or could it, would it? But when you're grasping at straws, you know, they're, they got to look everywhere. And they start every... The- Fingers start pointing at everybody because, I mean, there's just no other than the NyQuil bottle. They didn't find, from anything I read, like 
fingerprints on the bottle or any other type of DNA at the scene to mm-hmm. implicate anyone. It was all just kind of like uh, speculation. Yeah. During his investigation, Gustafsson discovered that horse breeders sometimes use strychnine to treat their animals. While many suspected one or both of the Alexanders may have murdered Patsy, both passed a polygraph, which cleared them of any involvement. These, these polygraphs are getting everybody off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was 19, you know, the late 1980s. Yeah. So that was one of the go-to methods. I, and you wonder with a case like this, if something like this happened now, what it's like anything, you know, what other technological mm-hmm. advances may have helped to uh, to track down who did it. In addition to the NyQuil bottle, authorities found other suspicious elements at the crime scene. Despite living alone, Patsy was found with two dinner plates set out on a tray. Although she had a state-of-the-art alarm system on her home, it had not been set that night. This led investigators to believe whoever targeted Patsy not only knew her well enough to be invited in for a bite to eat, but also knew her tendency to take NyQuil before bed. The type of strychnine inside her bottle of medicine was in pure powder form. This concentrated form of poison could only be obtained by someone with access to this federally regulated product. Even with these clues and suspects, Patsy's murder went unsolved. So the brother-in-law is the one who said, I moved two plates out of the way when I was trying to get to her. Oh, so he told that fact to police. And the cops say, we don't remember any plates being there. Interesting, because this is definitely one of those pieces of evidence that has followed this case that Mm -hmm. everyone says, well, the alarm wasn't set and there were two plates out. So that must have meant that she invited someone in. Also, if he says he moved it, that explains, you know, if he had any fingerprints on anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Patsy had not been the only sudden death connected to the Wax Museum. In September of 1984, 23-year-old Lori Williams died. Lori had been a part of the Wax Museum family for years. She started out in souvenir sales and moved her way up to being Patsy's assistant. Lori and Patsy's relationship was so close that Patsy's whole family attended Lori's wedding, according to her mother's interview in the Star-Telegram. In the month leading up to her death, Lori complained of extreme abdominal discomfort. Doctors suspected she may have appendicitis and suggested surgery to fix the issue. Lori agreed and doctors removed her appendix. However, after the surgery... Doctors were surprised to find that her appendix was completely fine. It had clearly not been the cause of her stomach aches. I guess that's not something you can find out until after it's out of you. Well, I mean, and if you look and go, well, you know, the x-rays show one thing, or I'm not entirely sure on the history of MRI technology or CT scans, and you go, well, you know, I mean, I think CT scans were back around back then. I just don't know that they were, you know, as clear as they are today. Mm -hmm. You go, well, there's really only one way to know. Let's get in there and look. And then you go, yeah, there's... It's fine, but, she, you know, she was complaining of such extreme abdominal pain. They're like, oh, clearly it's appendicitis. Mm-hmm. You know, you just go back, go based upon the symptoms. Although she survived her appendectomy, a few days after, Lori passed away. Her cause of death was listed as viral pneumonia related to her surgery. Lori's family was heartbroken, as was her boss, museum co-owner Patsy Wright. When Patsy passed away three years later in 1987, and it was revealed she had been murdered, Some of Lori's family members became suspicious. Private investigator Bill Deere stepped in for these family members and worked with them in trying to determine whether Lori had truly died of natural causes or if she had also been murdered. And that is something that, you know, you're you're told, hey, it's natural causes. It's just it just happens to be viral pneumonia. But that doesn't still doesn't the pneumonia doesn't explain the month of extreme abdominal pain. Yeah. So it it, maybe it explains the death, but it doesn't explain why she even went under the surgery in the first place, especially if the appendix was fine. So when your boss slash, you know, close family friend is poisoned and, you know, you just it's not that big of a leap to go. Well, maybe that was the cause of the stomach Mm -hmm. problems. Lori's family worked with authorities to exhume her body. The process was complete in 1989 when her tissue was tested for possible signs of poisoning. Arsenic poisoning can mimic the signs of appendicitis, so that particular poison was the focus of the investigation. However, the results showed no signs of arsenic in her system, just in case her tissue was also tested for strychnine. According to Bill Deere, there were traces of strychnine found in the test, though the results were ultimately inconclusive. And if, you know, you're microdosing somebody with strychnine Mm -hmm. and it doesn't 
it, over the course of a month, and that's how long she, and then it has deteriorated, the tissues deteriorated, and the years have been buried. It, sadly, it's not going to show much. Yeah. And Bill Deere said in an interview that he thinks Lori was killed to scare Patsy. Mm-hmm. They knew, someone knew how close they were, and they kind of did that to, to get at her. Mm-hmm. A year after Patsy's death, on September 4th, 1988, the Wax Museum mysteriously burned to the ground. The circumstances surrounding the fire were suspicious. Investigators speculated an accelerant was used to intentionally start the blaze, but were never able to prove anything. However, as police and fire investigators were combing through the crime scene, they saw something strange. A man digging through the burnt debris. They began chasing him, but he tossed the item he stole into some nearby bushes. Hot on his trail... Police found a financial ledger, stolen from up on a shelf in the charred back office. As the man sped away from the scene, police took down his license plate number and tried finding him. It took nearly a year, but they finally made an arrest. Two years later, in March of 1990, the museum reopened. So another wax museum fire, eh? Closely related to the one in Galveston. Mm-hmm. You know, as far as the some of the players are the same, at least related to each other. Fire is, um, I don't know if it's common, but it's its such a, like, epic thing. And so, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? That when that happens multiple times, it seems like it raises flags. It's like there's a pattern here. It's why are there so many fires involved with somebody that might be involved with these people? With it, yeah, or the insurance policy. Also, an accelerant was used. It's called wax, and the place is full of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, full I mean, of it. It goes up quick when you've just got a bunch of giant candles uh, and a everywhere. bunch of guns. They had the Wild Wild West mm-hmm. gun collection. Yeah, not the movie, the actual Wild West. Mm-hmm. On September 26, nineteen eighty nine, Stanley Lester Pointer, also known as Stephen Lester Pointer, was arrested and taken to a Grand Prairie jail on a $100,000 bond on charges of burglary in connection with the museum fire. According to private investigator Bill Deere, Pointer was a suspect in all the mysterious incidents at the museum, including the fire, as well as Patsy and Lori's deaths, telling the Star-Telegram. He's being interviewed concerning anything concerning the case, a burglar, deaths of Patsy Wright and Lori Williams, and the fire at the Wax Museum. Pointer complained that private investigator Deere was sullying his reputation, and that he only took the ledger as a souvenir. However, Deere doubted this, saying, He would have to cross the entire wax museum, passing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of artifacts, including Jesse James's guns, and climb upon a chair to get that ledger off a shelf. It certainly doesn't seem like... No. If I'm going to go for a souvenir from a wax museum, I'm not going for their financial ledger. How would I even know where that was? Nope, you want to melt it off Ronald Reagan head. We know it. <laughs> 100%. I want that Get hand. It. I want that Reagan hand. <laughs> the Reagan yeah. hand. But yeah, it's bizarre. And they said, like, it's not like, oh, well, I just walked by and the closest thing on the ground next to me was right. this book and I just grabbed the book. You had to walk through all the way, 35,000 square feet, all the way to the back, climb up high, you reach had to know up where high, it was. Yeah. Know where it was, too. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing. In the end, Pointer was only charged with burglary for the theft of the ledger. He was already wanted for arson out of Austin and theft in Dallas. However, Pointer died April 13, 1991, in a shootout with police. Deputy Police Chief Rick White told reporters in 1991, We hope to get that final piece of evidence that allows you to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Private investigator Deere remained hopeful. All it will take to break this case is one phone call. One person knows something. So Pointer was already wanted for arson. Had a reputation of being a criminal. Yeah. Then he's found going through the debris at this other place that burned down. Mm Mm-hmm. He had a real weird background. He was, you know, and it's like, who, how was he even related? They also said it was really weird because it was like the fire started at like 4 p.m. on a Saturday and burned for a while. And then it's dark outside by the time he shows up and he starts looking around, sees the car. I mean, it was like, like you said, he had to know where it was at. And he just did, when the cops see him, you don't go, sorry, guys. I was just here to steal something. I mean, he throws it, runs away. I think he was hired by someone or someone told him, you need to go get that. 
and that told could, him I mean, told him where it was. Cuz yeah, cuz why else would you go know where it is? Go get that. Mm-hmm. He was he started as like a pharmacist and he was a deli clerk and he eventually ended up being a working in a funeral home if I'm not mistaken is when they finally arrested him. So he had this kind of series of odd jobs that was kind of described as kind of quiet and everything, but it is just like so bizarre if he was not asked to be there, why at that day? I mean, uh, the the fire was a big deal. There was like the photos of it. You could see the smoke. Grim Prairie is uh, west of Dallas, you know, along the highway. They said you could see the smoke from downtown Dallas. It was like, obviously, because of all the wax, plumes mm-hmm. of smoke in the air. So it wasn't like out of the ordinary that you may be like a looky-loo and you want to like mm-hmm. drive over there. But to drive, park, sneak, there's something beyond just yeah. natural curiosity. I think he was... Told to go get it and yeah. told where it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think he may have also been told to set the fire. He was already wanted for arson out of Austin. Yeah. So it wasn't too far out of his wheelhouse. And he possibly could have set another fire. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's the a- fact that he's wanted for arson to me is a a pretty big red flag. And then yeah. he's found going through another building that was also the cause of arson. Well, and we, and they said, well, we think an accelerant was used, but we're not sure. And I, again, aside from being silly that there's wax figurines everywhere, during that fire, you know, customers were saying, oh, we didn't know what was going on. Like, we thought it was, it smoked so bad, we thought it was part of the show. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's not like, well, we had a little bit of an electrical fire and it, you know, it smoked so much. And then by the time the cops came, just, I mean, to their credit, they responded quickly. It was this huge blaze. That sounds more intentional than, yeah, whoopsie, we might have. And then, um, as we discussed in the live show too, uh, they just kind of called it a total loss and were like, well, I just throw it all away. We just want the insurance money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. The, one of the investigators was like, I was shocked at how little people were really paying attention to the wax figures or cared about trying to, to save those. Or salvage anything. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, will say, if this was arson, to do it during business hours bold. is a bold choice. Bold That's, move. You know, I mean... Uh, that sends a message in and of itself. True. Yeah. It's like, because they're customers. Yeah. It was not just a yeah. random no, day. No, you're I mean, willing to take there. out a bunch of, possibly kill a, a bunch of innocent people. A Mesquitian from my own hometown was in there. So mm. He was one of the guys that was interviewed. Mesquitian. Is that what you guys call yourself? I made it up, but yeah. <laughs> a gentleman from Mesquite. But yeah, I'm I mean, going to start calling Tommy a Mesquitian. <laughs> a Mesquitian. Yeah, we're Mesquitians. But yeah, you're, you know, it's just a family trying to enjoy a nice day. And you're yeah. like, fuck okay, it. It's ready to go. Yeah. Start the blaze. On January 1st, 2004, Steve and Sally closed a deal to sell the museum to Ripley Entertainment. Steve told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. He was diagnosed with cancer in late 2003. That was a little bit along. In the interview with the Telegram, Sally described the sell as emotional for her. She was parting with her family's business. Once the deal was closed, the Wax Museum was put under the control of Ripley's Believe It or Not. And Sally had also beat cancer. Yes, and he said that inspired him, that he wasn't, you know, yeah. wasn't too worried. But by the time, you know, that was... I think 15 years before he got diagnosed or 17 mm-hmm. years before it. So he said, you know, I've seen my wife do it. I think I can do it too. But, you know, you get older, you're like, it's time to retire. It's a good time to get out of the business. Mm-hmm. And even though she did not like him, Patsy did tell friends and admitted that during that time, he was Steve was really there for Sally when she was mm-hmm. going through all of that. So, you know, it's one of those things where you may hate someone, but you're still able to admit when they do something good. Especially for somebody you love that yeah, much. Yeah. You know, you're saying, he's the son of a gun, but he, he was there for my sister. Mm-hmm. Patsy's murder, Lori's death, and the fire at the museum all remain unsolved. Family and friends continue to grieve the loss of their loved ones and speculate as to who could have killed Patsy. With multiple suspects and motives, it seems as if the case should be more solvable. However, Bill Deere doesn't agree, telling D Magazine, Things are too obvious. I think this is something besides what it looks like. If you have any information that would help law enforcement, call Crime Stoppers of Tarrant County at 817-469-8477 or submit your tip online at 
tips.com. So what do we think? Bill Deers, this is an interesting theory. It's beyond what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Things are too obvious. You know, I'm always the Occam's razor way of thinking. But perhaps in this case, it's not um, as clear cut as what it may seem. I think it's hard because, you know, for every it's almost like for every suspect, there's a reason why they would do it, but a clear mm -hmm. reason why they wouldn't or couldn't. And so it's I think that's what makes it so, you know, seemingly unsolvable that you think like, well, it, you know, she had the beef with this person, but also, you know, they didn't have access to her house or she had, you know, this interaction with these people, but she, they weren't going to be at her house that day. She also was dating someone and had a boyfriend at the time and it was long distance and he lived in Austin and the night of her death she spoke to him on the phone mm -hmm. and it was confirmed he was in Austin so and he was devastated by the news so that's another thing that kind of strikes me as odd is if there were two plates there and the brother-in-law is saying he had to move them out of the way then that implies they were eating in her bedroom mm -hmm. on her bed which is an intimate thing to do yeah. And and if the police say they don't remember the plates, you know, mm -hmm. was it she had a plate one night, she left it in there, and that night she brought a second plate in. You know, that you know and be it's it not too. relevant. Yeah. So whose are they? And I think back then they were not going to, like, sweep the plates for DNA, 1987. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, and if they got moved around, jostled around, touched by other people, then that's destroyed. So it's hard because the evidence that you do have, pretty much all we have is the NyQuil bottle. Yeah. And yeah. then the fact that the alarm wasn't set, but it's a rental house. Did you forget to set the alarm? The other weird thing is Sally remembered Patsy telling her that her spare key that she kept above the dryer hood at the house had gone missing a few weeks before. Oh. So that's More another access. thing of, yeah, somebody knows where you're keeping stuff. They are, you know, I, it, this, obviously wasn't a random act. Mm -mm. It was 100% somebody that she knew and knew well. Very well to know that she would drink the NyQuil. Mm -hmm. And also possibly if they had taken the key, then they may have the alarm system code or, you know, there's some sort of thing you can press inside the house once you're inside to disarm it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, after she'd taken the NyQuil yeah. that you placed at a, a time when, you know, you had access. Yeah, maybe you wanted to go back and check and see if the deed had been done. Mm -hmm. Her friend and financial advisor, Karen, told D Magazine that it was so well known that she took NyQuil and had, oh, okay. and had given it... They'd given it to their kids because <laughs> they both had young kids at the time. It was a different time, but then for when, you know, and she's, and then she started taking it to help her sleep. And she said people knew that were close to her knew and that Karen would joke with her and call her a NyQuil head, which mm. is kind of odd that, I mean, but you know, I don't, is it dangerous to take that every night? I don't know. And yeah, I, I can look it up if I, if I want to know. So don't. We don't all have to get into a debate about it. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you should only take medicine as prescribed. I think that? that's I Some think people that's true. woof Benadryl to sleep. Some yeah. people suck down NyQuil to sleep. Again, it's between them and their doctor. Only take medic medicine as, as prescribed or as written on the back of the bottle. But what it is, is to me, then that expands the circle of suspects. Because initially it was, you know, she, those closest to her knew that she took NyQuil. But if you got your pal... At a dinner party being like, oh, NyQuil head over here. You <laughs> right. probably shouldn't have any wine. You're going to go home and drink NyQuil later. Then that's more people that may be like, I'm going to get her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She takes a NyQuil every night. I just have to go in and put a little. And to me, so, you know, going back to kind of the profile of a poisoner, it's somebody that's sneaky and cunning and can lie in wait. But putting nine times the amount of strychnine mm -hmm. in the bottle, to me, tells me it's not somebody with like a medical or pharmacological background yeah. because you would know that's too much. Like that's wasting it. Or is it somebody that, I don't know, went to pharmacy school and or was worked as a former pharmacist? Which pointer. one? Oh, Pointer, pointer. did. Yeah. yeah. And it says you, it's federally regulated, though. So did you get it because you give it to your horses? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like who had access? How did you get it? Or, you know, you know somebody on the, the dirty market and you can yeah. say, hey, give me some strychnine. But, you know, is it 
he was incompetent and, you know, or whoever did it was incompetent and put nine times the amount in because they were just like, oh, dump a bunch in there. Or was it, I'm going to make sure even if yeah. she sips it, she's going to die. Yeah. And the strychnine apparently has kind of a bitter taste, but the taste of NyQuil kind of masked it. Mm-hmm. So, and also, once you've drank it, if there's nine times in there, it doesn't matter if you're like, well, that didn't taste right because it's already in your system and, and wrecking you. I think um, the key missing could also have, I mean, that could have been taken by someone. And for weeks, maybe that strychnine was sitting in the NyQuil bottle. You know, maybe they took the key. Yeah, or maybe, you know, maybe she went a couple nights without drinking it. And they had, somebody had used the key, gotten into her house when she wasn't there, put the strychnine in the NyQuil bottle, left, and then... Just waited, waited to see what happened. Like, I know it's going to happen someday. Yeah. Well, I always had it in my head, just kind of one of those things you hear that, oh, women are more likely to poison yeah. than men. But I looked it up on it's Psychology Today. and a, Psychology a psycholo- Today, I love that website. And this is a, a psychologist, Joni Johnston, psych, uh, Dr. Joni Johnston, said, contrary to popular belief, the majority of convicted poisoners are men, overwhelmingly mm. so when the victim is a woman. When the victim is a man, the poisoner is equally likely to be female or male. Very interesting. And it said also, as with other methods of murder, perpetrators rarely cross racial lines when they decide to send a victim to an early grave, meaning uh, Caucasians are, tend to be poisoned by other Caucasians, as with African Americans and Latino, etc. So on average, the homicidal poisoner is five to ten years younger than his or her victim. Do we know how old Steve Pointer was? He was younger. I, mm. I I could go look up white? his exact age. Yes, white a younger white male. And you it know, says career wise, homicidal poisoners are overrepresented in the medical field. Doctor, nurse, lab professor, pharmacist, mm. uh, where they have easy access both to the means to kill and vulnerable victims. So I don't know. That's you know, it, Bill Deere seemed to think it was him. They got into it because Bill Deere's. There's a whole separate D magazine article about Bill Deere and how he kind of would. Um, I don't want to say force his way into, but he was pretty boisterous. He was willing to talk to the press. He would hook up with these families that have been through something and kind of be their spokesperson in the media. And when Stephen Pointer was arrested, then, you know, he was all in the media like the cops are looking at him. It was him. And then Steve Pointer was like, you're ruining my life, Um, even though he'd kind of already ruined his really? life. Really? I don't a, think you can. He, he was street. Compl- yeah. Yeah, he was wanted for arson and theft. And then, yeah, the shootout with the police is because he drove into the police officer. Isn't that, was that right? Or he jumped in front of a police car. Something it like was, that, yeah. It was some violent, you know. So he, he kind of had a track record. I'm not saying that, you know, it's necessarily him because of that. But he, he wasn't afraid of committing crimes mm-hmm. and kind of fits this profile of a poisoner. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's one of those cases. It's where there's a lot of suspects. It's like a a murder mystery movie. There's all these suspects that it could have been and everyone kind of has a motive, but also everybody kind of has an alibi. Mm -hmm. So you're not really sure. Yeah. And then, you know, in the movie, it's usually the person that just had like a small cameo in one scene that everybody forgot about. And then it Mm -hmm. comes back. And so it isn't what it seems like Bill Deere is saying. It's not as simple as it seems. If it is him, you know, if it is Pointer, and obviously he he's passed away, but he didn't just randomly start right. no. doing all this. He was hired by somebody. How was he involved? Yeah, and why? So there's a lot of unsolved things. If somebody, like I said, if anybody knows anything, Tarrant County Crime Stoppers, it's ongoing. Yeah. What does your gut tell you? I think Pointer was involved because the whole ledger thing is weird. Rolling yeah. up, stealing the ledger specifically, knowing where it was at. But as far as who hired him? Mm-hmm. It would be somebody, I would say, who had a exactly what uh, Sergeant Gustafson said of one of the many motives, somebody that had a financial interest mm-hmm. in Patsy being dead. You know, what do you stand to lose if she doesn't die? If she dies before the buy-sell agreement's rewritten, you know, what do you stand to gain? If she dies before your trial, mm-hmm. what do you stand to lose if she doesn't die? I think those are viable suspects. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. It's just who 
who is it? My gut leans one way. Mm-hmm. Um, based upon the evidence, my opinion, I lean towards the ex-husband. And that's a possibility when you have a history of possibly being accused of burning your own museum mm-hmm. down. And then the evidence that would have pointed to that is, a.k.a. her testimony is destroyed before the trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would not be unreasonable to uh, to form that opinion based on what we've discussed. He ran with the glitzy crowd in Dallas, but he also had a known gambling problem. Mm-hmm. And through that... I think you can meet some shady and seedy characters. And if he meets Steve and, you know, uh, point. Yeah. Yeah. I think you think you can hire someone to burn your own place down and then maybe hire someone to burn another one down and then tell them where stuff is. I don't know. It seems um, all a little too coincidental. Yeah. And and that's my question would be, I feel like my gut says that Stanley Pointer was involved, but who Steven? moved him in? Stan- or, did I call him Stanley? Stanley? No, he has two names. Oh, that's <laughs> he, right. He was, he was Stanley Lester Pointer, Stephen Lester Pointer. He lived a loose life. He yeah. had two names. But Pointer, it, my gut tells me he was somehow involved. Mm-hmm. And the que- the big question is, and I think the key is finding out how he was connected and with whom he was connected to get looped into this. Why was he at that fire at that day, at that time, in that part of the building, former building? And because he's dead, it's probably not something we're going to find out. No, no, probably will not. Hopefully if there's, like I said, if he talked to somebody before he passed away or something, that that may be the only way. Yeah, or someone, you know, knows something that just... um, has never come forward or it's something inconsequential that they think wasn't a big deal. But even with stuff like that, let authorities know, because even the smallest thing might be a big thing. Yeah. To the cold case investigator Mm -hmm. that that's been working it for however many decades, Mm -hmm. that's the one thing that could have helped unlock something. So never, no tip too small. Exactly. Just like there's no small actors, there's no small tips. That's right. Well, if anybody knows anything, let um, investigators know because it'd be great for this family to have some closure. This it's always cold cases are so uh, like as a family member, you never can just feel settled. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you just have to live with this constant feeling of uh, not of non closure. Is that how yeah. you would say? It? Yeah, and it's I like mean, an open wound for, yeah. for this many years. And even this, you know, I tend to be an optimistic person, but for some reason, you know, with a lot of cold cases, I feel some pessimism that I'm like 35 years or 34, 35 years. But when we cover that uh, cold case playing cards, Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of the cold case playing cards on that mini-sode, some of those were 35, 40-year-old cases that it was literally... I was there, you know, I dated him back then and he told me and I was so scared of him. But now that I know he's dead, I'm happy to come forward. And families were getting closure because someone who, again, it was kind of a throwaway of like, I was with him that day. I just didn't know who to tell. But now that I've, you know, seen this on the TV or heard this or whatever. So something that seems innocuous, it it really, it it happens. I mean, stuff gets solved 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. So I, I will, I'll try to change my pessimism to optimism that somebody will eventually come forward or someone that was in jail with someone yeah you know i mean if pointer was in a cell with somebody and admitted to something because he wanted to brag about it or whatever and like that person comes forward then that's how a lot of cold cases get solved too or just bragging in a bar that yeah. happens too yeah 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 well that is um our episode on on the unsolved murder of patsy Wright. if you want more information on the wax museum that she co-owned then if you haven't listened to our live show, um, go listen to that, especially after this one. It would be a nice little pick-me-up. Yeah, it's it's like I said, we focus way more on the actual fire and more so just the concept of wax museums mm-hmm. in general. And, and how paranormal they've... stuff. Yeah, and, and our experience, which was just a great time. Yes. It was really, again, thank you to the Bolton family yes. for creating such a, it's a, it really is, you know, when they rebuilt it, it looks like the 
people say it looks like the Taj Mahal. It's not meant to. It does kind of, but it's meant to look like a castle that we discussed in the live show. And it's again, I've had beautiful memories from when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. We'd go on field trips. It was like for your birthday, you would get to go and make your wax hand and the thing. And so going back with you and Leanne, we had a good time and we made a very fun video of our experience on uh, this on Patreon as well. So it's one of those where. The f- they they have left a legacy in the DFW for area. sure. Yeah, I'd never been. That was my first time. Which Glad to be there. You can you will garner from the video because I do <laughs> not understand. I didn't understand the Ripley's Believe It or Not concept. Now I and- do. I understand now. <laughs> I just love that you go through life with curiosity where you're just screaming <laughs> at the laser room. You're questioning what the believe it or not. You're hollering at the mirrors. It's great. It's fantastic. The, uh, I, love, I only want to experience life with you. Oh, that's going to be on our quotes for this week. Oh, <laughs> And I'm going to have my own personal t-shirt made with um, your face. Like, hi. <laughs> well, we have a very fun thing happening tonight at 8 p.m. Central Time. Heather, I, I think we've <laughs> nailed down what yeah. show, what Hallmark show we're doing. It would, my heart would soar on the wings of the Eagles if it could be <laughs> this Hallmark movie that involves ghosts, a lawyer, a haunted inn, <laughs> fucking. <laughs> It is a wild time. So uh, we're calling it Hallmark After Dark. Any subscription to Patreon will get you in a dollar up to $25 a month. And then you also get uh, whatever subsequent benefits come with that tier. Uh, if you like what you heard today, this is an ad-free episode. It's similar to what you get on the $5 So Sinister tier. But as our special uh, thank you to everybody for supporting the show on Patreon, uh, we're opening it up to everybody. We want to party with everybody. And the Crowdcast uh, chat gets popping when oh, we're going it's live. so much so, fun. We would love for you to join us. Uh, so that is today, December 22nd, 8 p.m., Hallmark After Dark. If for some reason you're listening to this later, that's fine. No worries. Uh, you can still go on Patreon and watch the archive version. And I'm going to go ahead and preemptively say it was great. We had a great time. <laughs> oh, it was a hoot. There's you're no way we it. did not have a great time. <laughs> you're going to no love way. it. It's going to be love great. It. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tier, a special shout-out on the show, monthly bonus mini-sodes, including one on Fruitcake Fraud, Murdoch Murders Update, we got a Weird Dallas one coming up for you as well, and you get patron-exclusive video and audio content, including a video of us touring the Wax Museum, Christy eating fruitcake, which is funny as it sounds, <laughs> um, as well as some of our uh, audio p- uh, bonus content like Am I the Asshole, Relationship Segments, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines. We got all kinds of fun stuff going on over there. I'm about to, um, we're about to post in Am I the Asshole uh, today or tomorrow that, whoo, they were all patron suggestions. Yes. And one of them, our dear patron said, I can almost, I can hear Christie's disgust now. And I was disgusted. <laughs> I've thought about that like probably five or six times. Yeah. Of someone being like, I don't know, it's not very respectful. I was like, oh, you know, it's not respectful. I got a fucking story for you. And it's from this Am I the Asshole. So thank you to our Patreons for sending those in to us. You also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As where you can ask us all your burning questions on Crowdcast. For patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. To me, this is a perfect gift because not only by selecting this option, you get a free month of membership, but you've just given somebody a gift that they're going to enjoy multiple days a year. Every Mm -hmm. time they log on, they're going to think of you. They're going to owe you big time. They're going to think, God, fuck, what do I do to get a present that's that good? So next year, you're giving yourself a gift because next year they're going to try to outdo you. But all you have to do is renew that membership for them because it's the gift that keeps on giving. We figured out all your holiday problems just now. <laughs> Solved. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-outs. 
So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. We had somebody tag us that they were working from home in a Sinisterhood tee. Uh, I've gotten Sinisterhood merch for my own family, and our accountant was like, hey, what's this? <laughs> Who's buying merch? It was me <laughs> for my own family. If you love your family as much as I love mine, you should hop on Sinisterhood.com, click on Shop in the top banner, and get swag like T-shirts, mugs, totes, stickers. We got a hot sticker We just game. sent our accountant some stickers. <laughs> we love you, Mark. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. He um, doesn't know, so, so if he's listening, spoiler. It'll You're... get there. It, it, this will, hopefully our envelope will arrive before this airs. Okay. So if you want some cool stickers and match our, our accountant, Mark, head to SinisterHead.com and click shop in the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you out on the computer? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Angela Yu. Crystal Brown. April Hill. Kinsey. Danielle Grimes. Yvonne D. Maria Kraft. Hope Robertson. Annalie Smith. Queens Shank. Sherry Strutt. Megan Aton. Kai H. Shelly Graves. Eloise Tunmore. Chip Patreon. Lisa Donnellan. Susanna Scruggs Jarrett. Kaylee. Carrie Baranov. Ashley Gordon. Marie de Leon. Dating Baggage. Christy Chapman. Sarah White. And Miriam Secord. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We couldn't do this without you. We hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. <laughs> Sinister.